Great, thanks, Chris. All right, so again, my name is Kristen Thing, and um, I would like to tell you about a project I'm working on with Tidal Energy. And um, Python has really enabled this to happen. Each of um, me and my collaborators are using Python for our analysis and um, work and everything, pretty much, um, sometimes with some other code in there. And so uh, this is uh, mostly an interesting application that I'd like to share with you. Hopefully, you'll find it interesting as well. Um, I'm at Texas A&M. I'm looking at environmental impacts of turbine arrays. Simon Funke is a, a German guy, and he's now in Norway at a research laboratory. Thomas Rock is um, French, and he's in Canada right now at Acadia University. So we have a truly international um, collaboration going on here. So tidal energy, it is like wind energy, but underwater. Um, you can see here a um, kind of wind energy looking, tur or wind turbine looking thing here. This is um, probably an old design now for Verdant, and it's just going down under the water. It's hard to photograph them underwater, harder to photograph them once they're under. Um, ORPC um, is, uh, has this uh, sideways style that they're looking to put down there. And just to note, um, they're like ener wind energy, but we also have a lot of other things going on. Whales, ships, sea surface, fast moving water, nearby coastlines, uh, cities with people in them, uh, fish, and already damaged estuaries. So there's a lot of considerations to go on when you're thinking about um, actually putting these in the water and what you need to be thinking about. Um, so I'd like to talk about optimizing from three different perspectives representing these three different collaborators in this project. So first, array optimization, an array being, um, you know, having several turbines. So one turbine is not going to get you too far in terms of power production. So we're thinking about having a farm or an array of turbines situated somehow in a location generating power. So um, first we're going to think about that array optimization from power production perspective. So um, you might think about the number of turbines. We just have an illustration here for if you're looking kind of a map view uh, across the channel and along the channel with a headland here, you might think about different numbers of turbines and different layouts for those turbines and how much power you can produce um, given that. Um, you could do this with guess and check, but it would be probably be better for a um, number of different reasons to have some way of, of optimizing this in a, a um, more um, clever way. Uh, you might also think about the position of the turbines. So um, if we're again thinking about this as an idealized domain looking down on, we have flow coming from the left. There's no headland in this case, but each of these tur uh, red blobs here is representing a turbine. And um, in kind of the dumb case where you just kind of put a turbine, put turbines out uniformly um, in space, you can generate, say, 27 megawatts. In the case where um, this was optimized for power production, you can get an increase in the power production and a different layout for the turbines. So that's the sort of thing we're thinking about in this area of the optimization. This is a movie, and this is Simon Funke's stuff, the, um, the guy in Norway. So, um, again, the flow's coming from the left here in this movie, and the turbines start in this uniform um, a layout, and then they're moved forward. Um, according to his algorithm, they're basically moved around a little bit every time step, and there's an iteration in time to try to find the um, optimal position according to whatever you're trying to optimize. Um, in this case, I think they're just looking at power production. So you can see um, they're kind of move around in a cool way as you go through these iterations and you end up with kind of a weird looking layout that nobody would probably have thought of to do. So, um, he, uh, so Simon Funke uses um, two packages in particular to note, Open Title Farm, his group, and he, he have been active developers with this. And this is available on GitHub and Phoenix, a finite element solver. Um, both are available online and um, written using Python. Um, so just going back to think about where we ended up here, um, we, oops. So we ended up here with this kind of odd arrangement of turbines. And um, uh, you might note that, uh, so and first I should say they were um, space limited, so they had to be in this rectangle. That's why you have that barrier there. Um, you might also see that they have these kind of strange um, strings of turbines here. 
they end up possibly acting to redirect the flow. So you're kind of getting a, a more flow to these, these uh, subsequent walls of turbines. Um, you might say, um, yes, if you're optimizing for power production, that is what you'd want to do. But if you're optimizing in the real world, you also want to take into account money. You probably aren't going to want to stick useless turbines out here just to redirect the flow, <laughs> right? So that is where um, the next uh, area of optimization comes in. So Thomas Rock at Acadia is, is doing some work at Acadia University in Nova Scotia. And his, um, his, what he's bringing to the table is thinking about the money and engineering side of things. So you inherently have a limit in how many turbines you can actually put out there. And you want to actually be thinking about money as well in terms not just of power production, but other things. Cable cost, cable length, number of turbines, uh, transmission efficiency, installation costs. Maintenance, co maintenance costs, how long your project will last, and um, cost reduction due to learning. For example, there are lots of things to think about. Uh, this, this plot is just showing, um, say you might have a whole bunch of different parameters that you're considering in this optimization, and a way he's approaching, figuring out where to focus effort for this optimization is looking at the sensitivity of the results to these different parameters. So you see whatever the thing represented by the secret code is right here has a uh, strong importance. So if you change it a lot, the results are very sensitive to that. But some of these things you can probably change and they're not going to matter that much. You can kind of figure out where to focus your efforts. Uh, what I'm bringing to the table is thinking about environmental impact from the, your turbine um, array. So um, to start thinking about this, you can't get something for nothing, right? So if you're generating electricity by uh, moving turbines around from water moving, you are going to be slowing down the water. You're going to be impacting it somehow. So um, how much of the slowing it down is OK? Um, does it matter where it slows down? Is it, um, how do you measure that best? And what other properties are affected? And just a few more examples that people are thinking about um, increasing mixing in one area, which you might be doing by moving a turbine around. Increasing mixing in that area could reduce mixing downstream. And sometimes downstream is an area that's already considered fairly stagnant, or maybe you have some hypoxia issues where you have low oxygen, and there are concerns about um, impact because of that. You might also be thinking about increasing blockage in a channel, which can increase the sea surface height upstream. Um, and in a particularly interesting case, the Bay of Fundy, um, which is the place that has the really tall, the really big tides, 10 meter tides, something, 14 meter tides like that. Um, people have done some studies that if you increase the blockage and increase the sea surface height in just the wrong way, you can impact the resonance of the um, tides that makes that um, makes that um, tide so high in the Bay of Fundy, and you can actually potentially end up raising the tides in Boston. So that would be a very practical thing that you just would not be allowed to do. Um, and thinking about these sorts of studies are um, some of these things that we're thinking about. Um, another thing, um, say increasing flow in a certain area that's sensitive for larvae um, would be bad too. So maybe you'd want to think about optimizing so that um, spatially a certain area doesn't exceed some um, some increased flow, but maybe other places it's okay to increase the flow or decrease the flow, whatever your consideration is. Um, so again, all of our analysis is done in Python. Um, Simon's flow modeling and farm optimization, Thomas's engineering and cost analysis, and my environmental impact analysis and plotting that I've worked on. And here are some of the packages that we're using. All right, so I'm just going to tell you about an ongoing application that we've been working on. Um, we're starting um, thinking about a realistic place minus passage. So um, to orient you, here's Massachusetts. We have Maine here, um, Canada out here. Um, I believe this one's the Bay of Fundy. Minus passage is in here. And zoomed in, we have, um, this is some other modeling that Thomas is working on, it's shown here. But what we see here is a kind of headland type thing in a channel that's an area of interest for tidal energy. So what we're doing is um, we're thinking about this in the back of our heads, but we're stepping back to an idealized model. So we're just going to model a headland out of this. So this kind of thinking about this headland here in the back of our minds. 
Our goals um, with our work are, uh, and probably anybody's work thinking about this stuff, maximizing power production, minimizing cost, therefore maximizing profit, um, minimizing environmental impacts, because ultimately um, that is going to matter. I mean, presumably um, uh, permitting and other issues are going to come into play. So um, minimizing environmental impacts is also going to probably maximize your profit and being able to stay in business in the long run. And just to note that uh, the turbines can be represented in different ways. I showed you an sort of individual-based type of model where each little blob was a turbine. And I just want to note that I'm changing to a continuous kind of density-based model where um, the more red in this case is representing a higher density of turbines and, and more uh, less red or more blue, more whitish is a less dense um, area of um, turbine density, and I won't go into the details, but that's kind of um, from the algorithm side why you would choose which to do. Um, and just to note, uh, some of the analysis that's been done in this application by Thomas has um, wiggled all those parameters around in a sense in his um, analysis, and he's uh, in this plot um, lump them together into different categories. So what you can see is O&M, or operation and maintenance, is um, very important in terms of the this, this sector importance to um, the outcome. Um, but something like uh, turbine cost isn't as important. And this is sort of analysis that Thomas is thinking about. So let me show you the actual simulations. Um, this again is our idealized headland. We're looking down from a map view. And um, here's our headland in white. The flow is um, tidally forced, going back and forth, um, left to right in your view. And um, so here we have our tide, and um, what you're seeing is um, and whiter is uh, faster speed, and darker is lower speed, and there are arrows indicating the magnitude and direction overlaid. So the flow goes back and forth. The headland acts to um, uh, increase the flow in this area. and. Um, Presumably, if you're thinking about uh, some, putting some tidal turbines in here, you'd want to think about putting them in this area. But you wouldn't necessarily know the layout that you should use. And it depends on um, what, your, what your considerations are, what your priorities are. So um, stepping forward then, here, up here we have the base case. Um, OK. Um, at the top, we have the base case that uh, I just showed on the previous um, slide, and below it, I have two of the subsequent cases that we've looked at. So in one, we um, what I've called the non-optimized. Um, Simon basically put a blob of this uh, density of turbines, equally valued blob, in a rectangle just off the headland there. And in the lower case, he, he optimized it using some of these measures of um, Thomas's to think about a better layout to look at. So I've just plotted the contour there at the bottom, um, the contours, but you can see there, there are several different levels of kind of density of turbines that end up coming out of that optimization. And if you kind of look um, one to one, you can see that in the top case, you have just that regular flow going back and forth. And in the bottom two, um, sure enough, where the turbines are, you have a reduction in the speed. And you, um, you also downstream, you have a reduction um, as well. So um, these are some of these impacts that we might be thinking about how we can mitigate or what, what we might care about even in those. And uh, just to summarize that uh, change in speed, I've um, means, so here I've basically done a difference in the mean speed, the spatial uh, mean over time, but left in space here. So um, this non-optimized case compared to the base case with no turbines um, reduces the speed in this um, kind of large swath here. And the optimized case um, has a smaller reduction. Um, but um, let me note that we actually haven't optimized yet for environmental considerations. So um, that's kind of the next step. Um, we've been thinking about this from these first two perspectives and thinking about um, a proper procedure for going through these steps. And next, what, I'd, what um, we'd like to implement is um, taking into account in the optimization algorithm um, maybe um, having a check each iteration when you're running these turbines and um, if 
something like a speed is reduced too much in a certain area, then um, you can't, you know, arrange the turbines in a certain way. So the, these impacts, um, mitigating these impacts or putting caps on certain impacts could then be um, incorporated into the, um, the optimization process. Um, so, for example, uh, one thing we've started looking at is enforcing a maximum change in vorticity or some um, change in the rotation of fluid parcels around the domain um, to kind of think about changes to mixing. Something like that is something we can start thinking about um, fairly in a straightforward manner given the uh, model setup that we have. And um, after we've explored this from an idealized perspective, then we're thinking about moving to a more realistic case. So thinking about minus passage and actuality instead of the idealized version of it. So thank you. Well, uh, so the question is about um, the applicability of this to wind energy. And really, it would be the other way around. Wind, in, wind energy is, I think, 20 years ahead, I think they say, of tidal energy. Maybe it's even 30, 20 or 30 years ahead. So if anything, um, a lot of times tidal energy people look to wind energy. And um, uh, there's a lot of applicability. Um, one, in terms of this sort of stuff, one of the biggest things that's different is that um, we have the sea surface, we have a much more, we tend to have a much more constrained area. So we're looking at places where the flow is really fast. So that tends to be a very localized area um, and with the sea surface and the coastline coming in maybe in some sort of constriction. And um, in terms of getting the power to people who want to use it, we're also thinking about this in terms of cities nearby and that, that adds additional complications. So definitely looking to win for inspiration, but um, sometimes it's hard to apply. Um, yeah, oh, the question was, um, has the optimization looked at the sensitivity to um, the location, the actual locations where the turbines might end up? And yes, um, Simon's optimization code um, can be, can spit out information like that. Part of the method of um, it, moving these things around a little bit and iterating um, each step it's also very easy to look at how sensitive it is on those different steps. So that actually would be pretty straightforward. Um, okay, so the question is uh, thinking about uh, the spring and neap cy tidal cycle and bounding changes. Um, yeah, that, that would be important for the realistic case. So for this um, idealized case, we're just using an M2 tide, so a single tidal constituent, the, the main tidal constituent. So that's why you can see that the tide is very straightforward. Just a, um, For stepping to something like minus passage, then we would use realistic tides and um, everything gets much more complicated then, but um, that would be incorporated in using more realistic tides. Yeah. Uh, the question is about collision of animals with the turbines. Uh, that is how, research on that is underway, but not in, I don't think that would ever be incorporated in what we're thinking about. Um, but just to give you a feel, some, um, for example, the Pacific Northwest National Lab in Seattle has look, is looking at um, fish studies, kind of how fish interact with turbines. And um, my understanding is um, fish are fairly passive and tend to follow the, um, the flow um, around the turbine. So there's you know speed up around the turbine and they tend to follow that. They don't tend to go through the turbines. Plus also keep in mind the turbines are kind of, I think more kind of like, you know, 
this kind of speed, they're not like, um, they're not very fast. The, the fluid density is very high, so the, the rotation of the turbine is actually pretty slow. More worrisome is whales, and so people are looking at um, acoustic effect, potential acoustic effects on whales, and potential electricity, um, like e &M effects on whales. Um, but that's all um, specialized and would be hard to incorporate in this sort of thing. Okay, thank you. <laughs>